afternoon, my friends. Welcome back to another episode of Mastering Diagnostics. This is video number nine in the series. I'm Brandon Steckler, technical editor of Motor Age Magazine. You know, we spend a lot of time talking about tools, and we lot, spend a lot of time talking about testing techniques. And of course, both of those are synonymous with diagnostics, especially in the automotive field. But you know, the one thing we don't always talk about is the most important tool we will ever own. It's the one between our ears. It's our brain. It's our ability to think and to use logic. It requires a lot of logic to troubleshoot and efficiently and accurately diagnose problems in the automotive field, especially now, more than ever before, with the layers and layers and layers of complexity added from what we once knew from years past. So sometimes just stepping back and simply using your brain and a little bit of information before we even touch the car is, is the right way to go and could save you a lot of time. So let me tell you a story. Now, listen, this is a true story. This is not, this is not a bug or an experiment or some kind of fault I created as I typically do to demonstrate a testing technique or an ability, a, a way of capturing data so we can see the fault. This has nothing to do with that. This is a real live problem. Now, for those of you who don't know, I'm, I'm located in the, in the Northeast. I'm, I'm just Northwest of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And this time of year, it's getting cold. It's not bitter cold yet, but it's, it's pretty cold. Um, I have a 2006 Honda Civic, which proudly displays over 270,000 miles on the odometer. And the car runs great. I won't get rid of it because I love it. Uh, it runs absolutely great. Um, but it's getting old. Um, let's see, 06, it's, it's going on, what, 17 years now? And uh, again, the car runs really, really strong, but things are getting old. So the issue that came to be here recently is I, I wake up and uh, I, I leave my home at about 5 o'clock in the morning. And it's, it's darn cold when I go out there in the morning um, and I get in there and I usually hit my key and the car instantly starts cranking and runs great. Um, it still runs great, but listen to what happens. I hit the key to the crank position and nothing happened. Almost as if somebody had completely disconnected the battery. I decided to be stubborn. I hit the key and I did it again and I held the key for two seconds. Why? I didn't think I had a dead battery. All my lights in the car are on. The dome light was nice and bright. Uh, there was no clicking or any kind of issue with the starter, but I held the key to the start position and one Mississippi and two Mississippi and three Mississippi went by before suddenly the starter kicked in, cranked the engine over absolutely perfect. And then the car started and ran fine. I shut the key off. I repeated it. The car instantly started this time, as in no fault ever occurred, and it didn't do it for the rest of the day. But when I woke up the next morning and I did it again, the same fault was exhibited for about the same amount of time. Crank, nothing happened. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi. The starter begins to run. The engine cranks up perfectly, nice and quick, and the car starts and runs just fine. See that delay? That's what we're after. It only does it once. Now it's fine. So very elusive and something that can potentially tick off the customer. So as you can see, we went out to the car with patience. We're not in a rush. And once again, we hit the key all the way to the crank position. That would be terminal. Terminal number three of our ignition switch, and we listened. And during that three second delay, there was no starter cut relay click audible. However, after that three second delay, a moment before the starter actually engaged, we heard a click under the dash, and then the starter began to run normally. So let's go back to the wiring diagram and think this through just a little bit further. So I referenced a factory wiring diagram 
from my all data service information system. And I always wish to use factory wiring diagrams whenever possible because we are less likely to encounter mistakes. Uh, mistakes tend to occur when wiring diagrams are redrawn. And that's not to say even all data doesn't have issues like that. They do. But when I am viewing factory wire diagrams, I'm less likely to see something um, that's a mistake. So let's go over this entire diagram real quick, and then we will zoom in on the area of interest. So right now we have our underhood fuse relay block that allows battery voltage to supply current to our ignition switch. Our ignition switch, when turned to terminal number three, which is our start run terminal, excuse me, our start terminal, um, voltage current flow is supplied to the under dash fuse relay block at the starter cut relay. That voltage source from the switch feeds not only the control side of the relay that we are in control of, but it also feeds the switched side of the relay, the one that energizes the starter. Now, if our transmission rain switch is in park or neutral, we will be referencing ground, allowing current to flow through the starter cut relay control coil and creating it a magnetic field. That magnetic field will draw the relay contacts closed, supplying battery voltage to our starter assembly, which houses our starter solenoid. Of course, that's case grounded, as we can see here. And when that solenoid is energized, the starter solenoid switch contacts, much like the relay, will close and supply battery voltage through the starter motor where it references ground and makes its way back to the battery. So my idea is to monitor for current flow on the control side, this side right here of the relay circuit. Now, because this is a series circuit, I can monitor current flow anywhere between here and here. And I want to do so in the least invasive point as possible. So what I'm going to do is, because of the location of this ignition switch, I'm simply going to pull the steering column bezels out from behind the steering wheel. And I'm going to hang a current probe on this wire right here. Why? Because the current probe is going to show me a few things. First of all, anytime we're looking at current, we are looking at the work being performed. Voltage is the command for the circuit to work. Current is an evaluation of the work actually being performed. So I'm always going to recommend monitoring current to determine when a circuit is functioning properly or not. By placing my current probe right here, what that's going to allow me to do is not only see the current going through the starter cut relay control side of the circuit, but also the switched side of the circuit when it does indeed close. What I'm expecting to see is one of two things. Either when I hit the key, and the delay in starter engagement is present, we will have sufficient current through this circuit here, indicating that the starter cut relay control side is functioning properly. If that's the case, our problem is indeed mechanical and we require a relay. However, if current flow through here is insufficient, our fault is on the control side and we have to dig deeper to determine is there a voltage drop on this side of the starter cut relay control circuit? Or is there a voltage drop on this side of the starter cut relay control circuit? Now, depending on what scope you're using, we're definitely going to use a lab scope. You do not need a lab scope to monitor current flow, but I always like a visual interpretation of what's happening in the circuit. And besides, if I have a lab scope with multiple traces, I can tell the whole story on one page 
In other words, I could put one scope channel here to measure available voltage while I'm measuring current on another channel. I could put a third channel here to measure available voltage, or I should say uh, available ground potential on a third channel. And I can even incorporate a fourth channel to determine what voltage is available here if I desire. However, again, I don't think we have a problem here at all simply because the car appears to operate normally the moment the starter cut relay audibly clicks. So again, we can monitor voltage here, ground here, and current flow simultaneously. But I don't want to even do that. That takes more time to, to locate connector C, terminal 1, and connector F, terminal 29. I will first just implement a current probe right here, anywhere on the wire between the ignition switch, terminal 1, and the under dash fuse relay box. Well, we're out at the car, and I want to see if I can demonstrate what it is I'm experiencing with this intermittent um, delay in cranking. So as you can see here, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. This yellow wire, if you recall from our wiring diagram, vaulted supply to the circuit relay, the starter cut relay. I am on it with a Pierce probe. Let me zoom out again. With a Pierce probe. Some of us will be angry about this because they don't like to pierce wires, but it ensures a really good connection. Besides that, I'm going to make sure there's no damage to the wire when I'm done. And it's internal to the vehicle, so we don't have to water, worry about water ingress or anything like that. I am also going to take, let me zoom out again, this is tough with one hand, my current probe. If you recall what I mentioned many times is current is the work being performed. So if I connect my current probe it's going to allow us to see the work being performed through that coil relay circuit. So what I'm going to do is connect it to the same wire, ensure the draws are closed, and I will then connect the other end to my scope. Now we're going to go outside and connect to the ground portion of the relay circuit. So I want to find where this is located here because um, I obviously don't want to crawl under the dash to reference this ground leg that's going to be a real pain in the butt. Clearly this is near the ignition switch so I can get to that there. But I want to find out where this junction connector is. So um, I looked it up to save time. And the connector is located under the hood, back behind the brake master cylinder. And uh, it's not too easy to get to, but it's really not that difficult. We're interested in the orange wire for the automatic transmission, uh, the starting system. And that's the one I have indicated in the box, terminal 19. And if you look closely, oop, I'm attached right. Oh, let's see if I can do this without messing up the camera view. Right down there. On the orange and black wire leading from the under hood fuse under dash fuse box out here to connector c101 i'll zoom out so you see where i'm at so just behind the brake master cylinder for the ground leg okay i'm not trying to show you anything particular here so there's no detail and i see the glare on the screen already so don't worry about it we'll be revisiting this later i just want to show you i have the scope connected to my pc my amp probe is connected here at the ignition switch power feed wire showing the work being performed. My red lead is channel B which is my voltage feed to the relay coil and my green lead goes out under the hood to the ground side of the circuit representing ground for the relay coil. So this is likely not going to occur but let's see if the fault if the fault exhibits now. If not, I'll try it again later. At least you can see what it is I'm doing. So, let's go to crank. It did it, thank goodness. All right, I'm gonna pause my screen. And we will revisit this. So, we've got our capture displayed. I'm on waveform one of two. Let's scroll over to waveform two. And it shows our capture. Now, full disclosure, the capture you saw in the video of me in the car recreating the fault is not this capture. We're going to revisit that capture shortly. What you are seeing here on your screen 
is an even more intense and obvious failure for the same the same problem we have. In this case, I hit the key not once and released it, not twice and released it, but a third time before it eventually started, um, which is not on the screen here because I had already stopped the scope. But when I hit it once and then twice, um, the car, unlike before that you saw in the video where there was a delay in cranking, uh, there was no delay at all. It never did crank. I hit the key all the way to the start position, and it never did crank. So first things first, rather than looking at both of these, I'm going to zoom in on one. That's the benefit of being zoomed out. With 20 seconds on the screen, we have got plenty of time, plenty of time to see what's happening on all three of our channels, our voltage feed channel, our current flow channel, and our ground channel. So if I come over here and grab a zoom box, I'm going to capture this entire picture here. Now, again, what we show here, let me minimize this, get it out of the way. In red, we can look over here. I can grab a cursor. We are seeing just about 10 volts. And, you know, I've been attempting this all morning long. So um, to see that, you know, we've had a little bit of voltage drop, a little bit of low battery uh, not not uncommon to see something like that uh in blue is our amperage i'm sorry in green rather i want to get green is our ground trace and our ground stays well under 200 millivolts so what does that say about our ground leg right now where we reference ground on the vehicle there's no problem with ground at all so what i'm going to do just to make it easier to see i am going to turn off my ground channel because we no longer have to worry about it so now we are down to our red voltage feed channel and our amperage channel. Now, again, this vehicle does not crank. Right here in red is where I turned the key to the start position, and I held that for over two seconds with no response from the starter. But the takeaway from it is the amperage trace in blue. I'm going to zoom in tighter. When I hit the key, what you're seeing here, this, this noise, this high frequency noise, is arcing taking place across the ignition switch contacts. There's always going to be a little bit of arcing, but as they begin to wear and get old, as mine is, 17-year-old car, um, this arcing can eventually, and, and does eventually, become a problem. But what I want to show you here is the key is my amperage trace. If I come over here and I grab cursor... We've got almost over 20 amps of current flow. 20 amps of current flow says a lot. On top of that, we have this area right here. And for those of you who have visited my previous videos, we spent a lot of time talking about a pinnel bump. And when we move a ferrous metal through a set of windings, a magnetic field, it creates a disturbance or a counter voltage. And, and basically what I'm getting at here is this pinnel bump said that we have physical movement of a component that's being controlled. So there's two components being controlled here. If you recall from the placement of our amp probe, we have got our relay coil, which will energize, create a magnetic field, and close the relay, which will then provide amperage to our starter solenoid. However, that relay is extremely tiny. It doesn't pull much current. So the fact that we are seeing 20 amps of current flow here says two things. One, the relay functions just fine. The fact that the starter isn't cranking has nothing to do with the starter cut relay. We're beyond that. Two, it also says that I have continuity through my starter solenoid all the way to ground. Why? Because we're drawing 20 amps of current. That's a heck of a lot of work being performed. And that is going to create a magnetic field. And the third thing it shows us is this. Our solenoid physically shuttled meaning it closed it shuttled from from its rest period to throw the bendix drive out and engage the flywheel however it did not crank the vehicle we know that because we were in the vehicle we witnessed it not being cranked cranked excuse me but also there's no voltage drop here if we had that starter motor kick in the big heavy windings of that motor, that would easily draw battery voltage way, way, way down. 
and that's not doing that here. So what am I getting at? The failure you see on your screen here is a solenoid that physically shuttles, but the contacts that are supposed to close when the starter solenoid shuttles are not closing, not making contact properly, and not delivering the current to the starter motor windings, allowing it to turn. Now, let's go back and visit, since I don't have the capture of it, let's go back and visit the picture. Now, I got to apologize. This is real unconventional for me, um, but I have to display this for you because I have no other way of doing it. First of all, this was a picture-perfect capture of the failure. However, you can see the blue amperage trace jumps off the screen. I know you can't see this up here, but I didn't change my amperage range from more than 20 amps. So had I set it to the next interval up, which would have been 50 amps, I would have captured everything on the screen. My point is I could not reproduce the failure again once I had my scope set up correctly. When I say failure, I mean the one where it cranks with a delay. I can only reproduce the failure when it wouldn't crank at all. But since we already revisited the failure where it wouldn't crank at all, I want you to take a look at this trace because you'll you'll recognize it. First of all, blue is amperage, red is voltage supply, and green is ground supply. So what we see here is we've got amperage that shows up on the solenoid circuit. Of course, it goes above 20 amps here, which I know you can't see. But there's no, what I want you to look at is in red here is there is no activity for several seconds, or I should say several moments. And then all of a sudden there is activity. What was happening was we were getting the pinnel bump up here, like we talked about on the, on the previous capture. But it was a few seconds, few moments later that voltage started to arc, if you will, and, and energize the starter and get it to crank. So again, I apologize for the way you and I had to go about visiting this, but it was, I, I cannot reproduce the fault. I can't do it. I've been working on it for almost 10 days and it will not fail again. So the end result is the vehicle is indeed going to need a starter because the starter solenoid. So let's take it back to the wiring diagram again. We, we measured voltage here. We measured voltage here. So this was the red trace. This was the green trace. And our blue trace from our amperage probe was here. When we hit the key, although the vehicle did not start, we saw upwards uh, and above 20 amps of current measured through this yellow wire, which means not only did the starter, or let me back up and say, which means this solenoid had to be energized because it's the only device on this circuit that could pull that kind of current. That indicates that this relay did indeed close, which means the starter cut relay coil side, control side had to function normally. So my initial thought when I first got in this vehicle, when I first experienced the delay, I was listening for the starter cut relay. And I swore it was the relay that was not audible until the starter began to crank. But I must have been mistaken because clearly when I hit the key, we saw the 20 amps, which means the starter cut relay must have functioned. And that led current flow through the starter solenoid control windings to ground, causing the starter Bendix to move. However, the switch contacts here did not close properly. So I truly believe something mechanical is hanging up in here and it requires replacement of the starter. So as you can see, diagnostics to the untrained eye or to an outsider looks like magic. And many people assume it takes a certain kind of person to be a diagnostician, but that's not true. This is a learned skill. This is something anybody who can learn to use their mind logically and to step back and be patient and begin to analyze their surroundings can come up with a game plan. And if we understand how things work and we come up with that game plan using information sources like all data in this case for wiring diagrams, we can develop that diagnostic game plan and implement a test plan that will yield us information so we can make diagnostic decisions. 
with one simple connection, we were able to prove where the fault was. And it required the removal of three fasteners from inside the vehicle. We conclusively proved not only what was wrong with the vehicle, but what was good with the vehicle in regards to this starter circuit. So I hope you can take away something from this tutorial, if you will, and implement some of the techniques I talked about today. Thanks again for joining me on this episode of Mastering Diagnostics. Brandon Steckler, Technical Editor of Motor Age Magazine. We'll see you in the next video. Take care.